Hello all you lucky viewers out there. We just wanted to give a special shout out to our number one fan, Mr. Powers. Thank you for coming to our show. We love you. Um, and this is Pop Culture and Consumerism, Part 1, by Reed Anderson and... Sean Cunningham. Alright, let's take a look at our first slide. So we got a uh, popular literature during this time. So, this is our first question. How did literacy affect people's lives? We're going to answer that after we cover literature during this time period. The remarkable growth from this time period in the 1600s to the 1800s is a, is a big jump in literacy. You see, we got one in six males to about two out of three males. Now, that's, that's a huge jump there. That's like majority right there. Popular literature during this time was including pretty much fairy tales, medieval romances, true crime, and fantastic adventures. That's right, fantastic. It also included the most popular work of the time, which was the Bible, which is usually the most outstanding work. It is the most popular book and was printed on pamphlets during this time called chapbooks, which gave moral teachings and little excerpts from the Bible for the daily life. It's a pretty great time. Literature is at an all-time up. We also see something else brought about during this time period, which were almanacs, and I'm going to hand it off to Sean to cover this. Alright, in the almanac, there was much lore stored in it. Uh, almanac calendars listed secular, religious, and astrological event events, which were mixed with agricultural schedules and arcing facts and jokes. There was universe, it was universal for all classes, established common ground between nobility and common people. Uh, the answer to number one is... Right. I guess I'll be answering this question, ladies and gentlemen. Well, you see, the answer to question one is that literature helps spread enlightenment ideas among the people of lower classes and establish this common ground between them and the upper classes, as we see brought about through the almanac, which was very popular. And it would also come to inspire the American Revolution when we see Thomas Paine who wrote the pamphlet Common Sense, which attacked the weight of the evil governments against the natural society of men. So it's kind of spreading ideas around, and it's written form. People can read it now because they're literate. So, you know, go reading and writing. It's an awesome stuff. So I'm going to hand this back off to Sean. It's our first primary source, and it relates to what I was talking about with Thomas Paine. So here you go, Common Sense. Mankind being originally equal in the order of creation, the equality could only be destroyed by some subsequent circumstance. The distinctions of rich and poor may in a great measure be accounted for, and that without having recourse to the harsh, ill-sounding names of oppression and avarice. Oppression is often the consequent, but s seldom or never the means of riches, and though avarice will preserve a man from being necessitously poor, it generally makes him too timorous to be wealthy. Also, this is a perfect example of literature because we see that this man, Thomas Paine, who was not exactly like born in a nobility family is being able to read and write this great work which sold about 120,000 copies within the first month alone and it's it's just a perfect work it idea it represents the enlightenment ideals which were spread among all classes and created that common ground so that's how we see that this one primary source so we're going to take a look at some uh, more stuff through this consumerism and pop culture all right so we got leisure and recreation. Pretty much, uh, villages still remained more oil tradition. Peasant families kind of gathered around the fire to spread stories and chat about life and laugh and, you know, do what families do. Uh, some women during the time would actually gather around another woman's cottage and they would spin the stool and uh, talk and uh, gossip a little bit, you know, you know. But, uh, Pretty much they'd sometimes invite a possible suitor, maybe a lucky man like Skylar, I don't know. Uh, they'd invite him over and uh, chat him up and they'd look for, to see if he was possible suitor for the future, you know. Men would drink.
drink and uh, hang out and spread stories with each other. That was a, a popular thing that people still do today. They, uh, that's a oral tradition being spread around. And some leisurely activities would also include prepared foods, acrobats, and freak shows. Pretty much fairs were brought about during this time. So that's uh, recreation. It's a, it's a lot, of, lot of fun and good times. Alright, this is part two. I'm going to hand it off to Sean. Here you go. Also, leisure time led to the blood sports, which involved bull baiting or mm. cockfighting, which inflicted violence and bloodshed upon animals. Also during this time, carnivals popped up a few days a year, which involved drinking and masquerading, in which society was turned upside down. Uh, how did the growth in leisure and recreation affect the population of the 1800s, and what came out of it? Well, one sees that during this time, there was this growth from one in six men in Europe being literate to about two-thirds or nine-tenths, which greatly improved the pop culture of, of the time. The Bible was printed on pamphlets called chapbooks, which would also lead to later stories of fantasy and imagination, which allowed people to get away from their everyday problems. Soon, it would lead to women to meet up and chat up stories and spew, spin, and laugh sometimes inviting young possible suitors to their meetings, and men would go out and drink and share stories orally. This new improvement of entertainment also led through to other sports like bull sports, blood sports, such as boxing, cockfighting, bull baiting, bull fighting, etc., which were all to entertain and bet on. Also, carnivals allowed for a great way, a way where men and women could turn everything upside down masters ser serving servants, peasants dressed up as noblemen, as women, etc. Basically, we see that people are spreading stories and games and good times in which pop culture would blossom and people could reach out of their tough lives as peasants. New foods and appetites. Anybody here like chocolate? That was introduced around this time in Europe. Where do they get it? Uh other colonies. They didn't get it in Europe. They imported it. Yeah. Chocolate's good. You like it. New foods were imported from the New World, which was considered to be a delicacy. Delicacies were for the higher up classes. The poor people mostly got, you know, bread, beer, wine, water. They also ate a lot of vegetables, which they could use year round, you know. In the summer, they were fresh. You could have some fruits, maybe. Fruits did not not work o well with the uh, winter months, but you could use dried vegetables and soups and stuff, so they used that. Uh, although they were eating really crappy food, the nobility explored more exotic goods, you know. They imported from the New World some other colonies. Hot chocolate was made. Chocolate, people like chocolate. I just mentioned chocolate. You like chocolate? Hot chocolate? I love hot chocolate. Uh, Peasants believed in a just price, which was pretty much regulations by government to protect the consumer. So we see this introduction of that, which would later affect many New World people. Um, yeah, pretty much you just see this new flux in food coming in, and people's appetites and are quenched by these exotic foods. Poor people still eating crap food. Yeah. All right, I'm going to hand it back to Sean for, uh, I think, another primary source. Here you go. As for the market itself, it never sleeps. Perpetual noise, perpetual motion. The curtain, the curtain, never rings down on the enormous stage. Louis Sebastian Mercier, chapter thirty-nine. How the day goes. Bas this basically states that the consumerism during this time was at an all-time high. Uh, goods were up because of mass production due to the industrial revolution. This would set the groundwork for consume for the consumer revolution, which is a wide growth in consumption in west northwestern Europe. Rip. And this is Reed back with part two. How is everybody out there? During this time, men moved away from the flashy colors into a more modern look of a darker colored suit. So, you got that fancy look going on, guys. I like to look fancy. Um. But women, they moved to more flashy colors, and they wanted to express themselves and become individuals. And uh, certain things like bows and ribbons and new fancy shoes and dresses and fancy colors like green and frilly, you know what I mean? You know, dressiness. 
that uh, helped uh, set women apart from each other and made them individuals. So there was a lot of uh, consumerism based on their needs and uh, stuff like that. Basically because women were all into the clothing and the fashion and men weren't, the women consumed more than them. They needed more fabric and new clothing, which set them apart. Uh, housings, housing during this times was also uh, a big thing, because in the beginning there was really small, costly rent rooms, and they were used. And the rooms that they used were used for multiple purposes, such as greeting uh, friends or working, etc. Blah blah. blah. Houses would soon become more individualized at, the individualized at the end of the 18th century. People no longer had to share an eating bowl, and the smoky hearths were replaced, rooms were warmer, and the houses were better lit. So, you know, we see this uh, more comfortability with the houses. You change from, like, this kind of crappy, dinky house that you don't want to live in to this more modern house that's like, yeah, I'd like to live there. So, thank them for improving that. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna hand it back to Sean. How was society affected by the growth in consumerism? Because of the industrial revolution and colonies in the Americas, there was mass production productions in new various foods and textiles, which could distinguish a person's worth. Although men during the 1800s restored restored to the common darker colored suits that are still rev relevant in today's Europe. One sees that women really bought into stripes, colors, bows, trinkets, etc. Because of this, they became more distinguishable and could be seen on a higher standard for one individual. Rose Burton. It was able to make a woman from a poor family backgrounds into one of the most successful and arrogant entrepreneurs of the time period due to her work with the Queen. Bottom line, we see a flux and growth of good, of goods and its influence on how a woman is seen as much more than a peasant when she wears her her new bow or bright green dress. It really sets them apart and creates this consumerism, which laid a foundation for the consumer revolution, which was a wide-ranging growth in consumption and new attitudes toward consumer growth to consumer consumer goods that emerged in cities of northwestern Europe in the second half of the 18th century. And that is it. We'd like to thank Mr. Powers for having an awesome audience. We'd like to thank our audience for being awesome to Mr. Powers. This is a great video, and my friend Dylan wants to say hi. Here you go. Say hi. All right. Well, we're done. 13 minutes. Isn't that awesome? Bye, guys. No, I'm just kidding. Chocolate's awesome.